Hello, I'm Briganti of Blackbird of Blackbird's Brew. Happy Monday and welcome to Norse Studies Week 10. Ragnarok. From the Heathen Handbook by Woden's Folk Kindred, we are finishing up Section 6 today. And uh, whenever the subject of Ragnarok comes up, I am forced to confess my own personal misgivings that I have struggled with. And the fact that the very concept of Ragnarok, especially how it was initially presented to me in my very early years of study, it uh, put me off of Norse spirituality almost entirely. Uh, when you are raised a Jehovah's Witness like I was, it's impressed upon you pretty much on a daily basis that Armageddon is just around the corner any day now and it's going to hit. And uh, that you need to do what you're told and you need to fulfill every duty that's imposed upon you by that religion or else. God's going to get you. He'll destroy you. And then you add on the fact that uh, as a former Jehovah's Witness, you know, engaging in the door-to-door -door ministry wasn't just expected, it was required. And in the course of that, there was no shortage of people who told me about how certain they were that I was going to go to hell unless I conformed to their religious views. And uh, you end up with uh, the mindset that I have now of just being pretty tired of being threatened with divine judgment and a horrific demise if I don't conform and just do what I'm told. Now, uh, the Norse concept of Ragnarok is far more impersonal. It isn't about individuals being specifically condemned for any of their misdeeds, merely that all things come to their end. Still, it was an off-putting concept, and it has been a matter of me having to work through my own prejudices and preconceptions and learning how to become willing to have a more open and fresh view. So the authors first describe uh, the point at which Odin accepted that the end was inevitable, could not be averted, and that they mark this point as being after the death of Baldur. The established order would not carry on for forever, and the natural and logical consequences of all the actions that led up to that point were going to unfold. This affected the rest of the gods' control and their mastery over the world itself. Their desire for order was being challenged by chaos, and that point warrants a great deal of meditation in my opinion. I tend to think of order and chaos as being a seesaw. You know, only rarely is the seesaw even in, in complete balance. Usually one side is ascending, the other is descending, and each take their turn. Both have their function to keep everything in motion. Problems erupt when the motion of the seesaw gets too fast, erratic, or wild, you know, like, like this business. And if my uh, childhood memories are anything to go by, that's usually how things ultimately went on the playground. Now, the gods were experiencing this on a cosmic scale. And what I... And this is just my theory. Feel free to dispute me. Uh, but what I think really worked against them was the psychological impact of this, that all control and order is conditional and it's much more fragile than it first appears. I suspect also they experienced a sense of profound mourning, even more so than what the text tells us. Because when people or the gods are happy, the natural impulse is to desire for that feeling to last for forever. Of course, that's not how it works. And uh, after we exit a period of time in which we were pretty much happy and content, and we know that cycle is entering a less enjoyable phase, it can feel as though we have lost our ability to cope. And so we become consumed by the chaos instead of learning how to uh, navigate it and how to utilize it. Oh, excuse me. I'm perfectly fine until I sit down to record. Funny how that works. Anyway, next the authors describe the beginning pangs of Ragnarok. People are losing their moral senses. They cease to practice virtuous behavior and they are acting in a degenerate fashion. There's endless war. There's a, just common lawlessness. There's a three-year winter without any relief. Then a wolf eats the sun and another the moon. The natural order itself is collapsing. Fenrir breaks free from his bonds and Jormungandr rises up from the sea and floods the world. And that's just the setup, not the climax. This is all a signal that the real fireworks are about to begin. The gods and the giants are assembling to come together for the fight. And then we have Surt, a fire giant who uh, comes with his sword to set everything ablaze. Hamdal blows his horn and everyone assembles on the battlefield of Vigrid. Yggdrasil shakes amidst all the fighting. 
Odin and Fenrir fight, and Odin is swallowed whole. Then we have uh, Vithrar Vidar, who then avenges his father, Odin. Garm attacks Tyr, mortally wounds him, just as Tyr succeeds in running him through. Hamdal and Loki fight, to their mutual destruction. Freyr confronts Surt and loses, after which the world is ripped apart by fire and water. And then after all of this, when things have really reached rock bottom, Midgard then re-emerges from the sea and the sun rises once again. The few gods who survived Ragnarok take possession of a new, renewed Asgard, and uh, Baldur and Hodur also return to the fold. And then we have two humans, Lif and Lifrasir, who come back to the Midgard after hiding within the safety of Yggdrasil, and life begins anew. The authors then mention other stories about the end of the world that stem from uh, Indo-European traditions, the tales that come from the Greeks, the Celts, and the Iranians. The stories in theme and tone have a lot in common, and it's a clear pattern of beginnings, endings, and ultimately renewal. It is a total and complete cycle. Now from here, the authors discuss the continuation of the cycle and the necessity for all things to come and go at the moments that they should. They also show how this contrasts with the teachings of Abrahamic traditions and how the end of the world story is told in the book of Revelation. While heathens understand and embrace the circular nature of existence that things come, they go, and then they come back, Abrahamic religions are much more linear in their thought process. And their story of a new world emerging after Armageddon is one that is totally different and set up on entirely different terms than what existed before. So it's not a continuation, it's not a renewal, it is a here's the new setup type of thing. Now, the conduct between uh, the heathen gods and the, versus the god of Abraham is also highlighted by the authors. The heathen gods went out of their way to prevent or mitigate, postpone Ragnarok. They did everything within their power to ensure that the, this wouldn't happen. Now, some of their uh, decisions actually created uh, the inevitability of that outcome, but it, it was that, that wasn't known at the time. They were trying to avoid something. Uh, now, when you contrast this with the God of Abraham, who his the claim that is made through his scriptures is that he has the power to get rid of his opponents whenever he chooses, and he's just refraining from doing so, and that the intention is to have a knockdown drag out apocalypse later on down the road, and it's been turned into this whole test of faith for his followers. These represent very different mindsets, and we can't ignore the enormity of of a well of a of followers claiming that this divine being has absolute power without that actually being demonstrated or seeing the slightest sign of possessing it, and yet requires worship on that basis. I am the ultimate power, and in many of their mindsets, for many sects, it is that, that is the only power, and everything else is just illusion or demonic or blah, blah, blah. The usual drill we're all familiar with. Uh, very, very different characters there. Now back to Ragnarok and what it brings about. The authors really emphasized that what really brings Ragnarok about is the idea of moral decay, which is very interesting. Uh, for them, they explained that the death of Baldur took a great deal of what was good, upright, and virtuous out of the world. And I would add to their assessment that it also showcases the danger of outsourcing morality to an external force or being. Our goodness must come from within if it is to have any true meaning or value, if it is to have a hope of lasting or to be, be, to be able to be renewed. We can't rely on someone else to be that beacon for us. We have to train and abide by our own consciences. So I think there's an additional layer of a lesson there. Uh, the authors went on to say that the concept of Ragnarok, including its causes and outcome, is an illustration of the link or the bond between human beings and the universe itself. When we are operating and cooperating within natural law and we act honorably, things work out well. But when we seek to defy natural law and we make excuses to behave badly, then the outcome is bad. And the health of the world around us, both in the physical temporal sense, but also in the sense of human relations and also in the spiritual sense, it is a direct reflection of the health of people's morality. Destruction, therefore, is self-inflicted. And I want to stay on this for just a moment because there is a massive misconception about 
morality, ethics, and standards within paganism. When pagan faiths were reborn into the world, this was also a period of time when the sexual revolution was taking place and you had more people who were very foolishly embracing ideologies that de-emphasized personal responsibility, productive work, marriage and family, and the reality of how the natural order actually works. This was always an inherently incompatible, contradictory idea to paganism. But there were a lot of people who were just in rebellion. And this worked against a, a, a fledgling pagan community. And what made it even worse is that the people who were of this mind who had that mindset, very short term, but they liked some of the trappings of paganism, uh, they foolishly latched onto the false idea that if it anything that's opposite of what the Christian church teaches or prefers is therefore automatically pagan. I mean, which is just nonsense. I mean, just absolute nonsense. Uh, but for them, uh, what they were doing, it was about rebellion. It wasn't about theology, morality. It certainly had nothing to do with historical precedents. And this is the nature of the corruption that people who are honestly pagan and who are w reaching out to the gods and who are wanting to, to grasp onto uh, something that our ancestors had, this is what we've been fighting and refuting for decades, literally longer than I've been alive. Paganism is not about mindless hedonism. It isn't about sexual promiscuity or sexual indiscriminacy. And it certainly isn't about depravity of any kind. And paganism is definitely not about being attention seeking or doing things to piss off Abrahamic religions as, as if we were just attention seeking children. Let, let's we forget, pagan religion existed long before Abrahamic traditions were established or even thought of. And quite frankly, what I would really like to tell the people who are the most virulent posers of paganism is that our faith, pagan faith, it isn't about them. It isn't about their God. It plays no role whatsoever. They are not the center of the universe, and we do not accept their doctrine that their God is either. You know, as pagans, we are not godless. We are God full. We do have that moral sense of right and wrong. And we have an individual responsibility to cultivate virtue and to put it into practice. It really is on us. And exactly what choices are we making? And how are those choices and their consequences actually affecting our spirituality, affecting our practical everyday lives? Because remember, for much of pagan history, these were not viewed as separate concepts that you could just put in separate boxes and deal with independently. It was all interwoven. So with all of this in mind, what is Ragnarok? I think we could see it as many things, depending on, you know, the vantage point we're looking at, at the scale we're talking about. Uh, you might say that we have a Ragnarok every year with the winter, some, especially with some winters being more severe than others. But we know that the renewal of spring always follows that. Another way to look at it would be that uh, Ragnarok comes at the end of a chapter in history. You know, the end of era has come to an end and there's a massive uproar and lots of change that goes along with it. And if we're looking at it through that lens, then we are living through Ragnarok right now. The status quo cannot continue and we can't just return to the norms of previous decades or centuries. And right now in real time, as we speak, people are deciding between good ideas and bad ideas and we'll see what prevails and we'll see what world comes of that. But in the cosmic sense, there will eventually be a Ragnarok for our solar system. The sun will go supernova, collapse into a black hole. But on the other side of that black hole, there will be a white hole bursting forth with energy and building blocks for new stars, new planets, hopefully, ultimately, new people and civilizations. So a piece of, the, of us will be there in one form or another. All things die, all things are reborn, and it all goes on and on. The cycle continues to repeat. And on a personal level, we may find ourselves experiencing a personal Ragnarok multiple times in our own lives, that we have endings and new beginnings, and we are having to reforge our lives on that basis and hopefully move forward and more productively. For now, for all of the turmoil of Ragnarok, no matter what context or, or lens we're looking at it through, I have found myself ceasing to view it as this catastrophe looming over my head as a threat. I am seeing it as the birth pangs of the natural order, pain that must be endured to get to the blessings on the other side of it. And ultimately, I am seeing it in a hopeful way. Yes, you reach that low point, but once you're there, it's time to go back up again.
pretty uplifting when you look at it from that point of view. So uh, that was my take on the end of the section. Uh, we have kind of a shorter video than usual for these studies, but, uh, you know, that's okay. I didn't want to tackle the next section going forward. Uh, so now let me know your own thoughts. Uh, what do you think of Ragnarok? Do you agree with the author's assessment? Uh, what is your opinion about some, some of the little asides that I've had in my own thinking process? Where do you stand with it? How do you interpret it? What do you think it means? Uh, what other nuggets of... Um, of wisdom perhaps could we really glean from all of this i'd be fascinated to have that discussion either in the comment section here or if you would come see me on gilded there's a link to join us in the description box below i'd be happy to have you and i would uh, really enjoy having a serious conversation on this matter i think there is a lot to uh to unravel here so hopefully i will see you soon for that uh but for now uh that'll do it for this video and i will see you next time Thank you.